Good morning. I hope you all are doing wonderful and that you're, well, I mean, it's my first week back to school, so I'm not sure if it was y'all's first week back to your job, but I hope your week has been wonderful. We are so glad that you're joining us this morning, whether you're here in the sanctuary with us or if you're online. We are so pleased to have you with us today. If you would stand and join and, and welcome each other, give each other a little bit of an elbow rub, a wave. Hey, how are you? Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? start today with Spirit of the Living God. Please join us. Thank you so much, Galen. We're going to continue worship this morning with Come Holy Spirit, Dove Divine.
to the angel of the church of Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misled my servants into sexual immorality and eating of food sacred to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she's unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you, except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious, I do, and then does my will to the end, I will give authority over nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Thank you again, Galen. I love it when he reads our scripture because he brings it to life and makes it make sense for those who maybe don't understand exactly what God's trying to tell us in a scripture. If you will join me in this next hymn, we are called to be God's people, which is absolutely true. Uh, it should be our number one focus in every single day of life. The, uh, the scripture that we get from this is, Offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2, 5. Please join me. Wednesday night during this month of January. 
So if you can, come to our Wednesday night services at 6.30. If you cannot, watch it on our uh, websites and our Facebook accounts that we have with you and uh, see what uh, we're talking about there. And I know we've had some that have watched it not just Wednesday night, but other nights of the week, so it's been great. I think we've reached out to more and more people by having this uh, internet type of uh, material with you. With that said, um, let me get you to stand with me for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day of Sunday, where we have a day of rest, yet it is a day to come to your house to worship you and to praise you, uh, for you have given us everything that we have, and we need to thank you for that. You have given us many, many different kinds of uh, gifts. Uh, that we have in order to do. We need to demonstrate and help us to demonstrate both our faith and our gifts together to show the kind of people we are Christians here and to help make more disciples that are not able to come to a church. Help us during the month of February to reach out and to pray for those that don't know you and help them to understand you. Uh, we pray for our mission within our church and our direction. Help us to best understand that you want us to teach about Jesus Christ and through biblical verse. We now lift up the prayer that your son called us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's table. In my home, you find if you open the pantry, if you open the medicine cabinet, if you look around the house, it seems like I have a lot of generics in the house. <laughs> I don't know if it's because I'm thrifty, 
conservative with spending my money or like my grandkids think just plain cheap. But that's, uh, that's the way it looks at my house. The one thing that I don't let in the house though is generic Christianity. My faith has to be based on what I feel is the truth. My prayer for this coming year is that if I, as I read scripture, that I listen to the Holy Spirit, that I might know more and understand more. Jesus desired to have a meal with those that he loved, his disciples. He knew the end of his earthly ministry was coming to a close, and it was important that he share things with the twelve. So they met in the upper room in a quiet place, and after they had prayed, after they had shared toward the end of the meal, Jesus took from table just simple bread. In breaking this bread, he said, this represents my body, which will be broken for you. Take it, eat. And likewise, Jesus took the cup, and after praying over the cup, he said, this cup represents my blood. My blood is to be shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins and for the sins of many others. Take this drink.
Appreciate that, Joe. <clears throat> Good to see you all again. This picture back here, familiar faces. Yeah, you, you, gonna, you gonna stay for another one? Oh yeah. All right, man. We got repeat customers. So Paul. good to first time. <laughs> all right. Glad to have you guys back. <laughs> it's glad to be here today. Uh, Don, I met Don about three years ago. And my uncle's in hospice, and uh, I really like Don. I can tell by his accent he wasn't from here. <laughs> but I don't know if you guys can tell by my accent. I'm from Jones. I'm from Wild. I'm not from Jones World, but maybe, maybe not. <clears throat> but, uh, Don, he asked me. Uh, you know, to speak about the, the church at Kairanza. And I said, wait, what about the church at Kairanza? He said, no, no, it's not, it's Thyatira. <laughs> and so that's what we're going to look at today in uh, Revelation, is the church of Thyatira. And before, before we get started in that, I was, I'm, my name's Trey Shannon, I'm I, uh, from Blyville, but I just share a little bit of my testimony. I came to Christ, I was 21, and uh, after three DWIs, lost a football scholarship, and uh, I was headed nowhere pretty fast. But, but God, he, he reached me through that, and I've, it's not, I've never been the same since. I got involved with the campus ministry, <clears throat> and uh, got discipled, and learned how to share my faith, learned how to lead small group Bible study, did that in dorms, uh, then went to another campus and started campus ministry there. And uh, it's, it's, it's awesome to see God work in people's lives. But it's awesome to be a part of that. And that's kind of what we're going to look at in Revelation 2.18 is this church at Thyatira, they, they were doing some good things, and, but they messed up. And so we want to look at that and, and, and see what we can get from that truth there. And if you got your Bibles or you want to turn to Revelation 2.18 and you've got to do a good job of reading it, I want to read through it again. And, you know, with this, uh, this fourth church, that we're looking at, and as this, uh, as he starts there, you, you get a picture of the Son of God. He says, eyes are like blazing fire, his feet like burnished bronze. You get this picture of Jesus, that he's coming with fire in his eyes. And it's, it's his judgment picture. And his feet are like bronze, uh, burnished bronze, or blazing, uh, clean bronze. It's a, it's a uh, his feet are pure. Fire in his eyes. You know, a lot of times we don't think of our feet being pure or clean. You know, back in those days, man, they used to wash feet a lot. And we got one of Jesus' last acts. He washed his disciples' feet. And we know the woman who uh, washed Jesus' feet with tears and wiped his feet with her hair. He said that was a great act of service. It, you know, and I know men nowadays, they, uh, they get pedicures. But anybody ever got, anybody, any man ever getting pedicures? Man, I, don't raise your hand, please. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and, and, and you know, I, I, got, I got four boys. Joe, Joe, you got three, and a daughter. He, he got a girl in the mix. We, we, didn't, we, we got all boys in our litter. But, uh, but a couple of my boys have gotten pedicures, man. I gave them a hard time about it. I thought, man, what is going on, man? But it, it's a new thing, I guess. But I, I had none yet, but I, 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 I probably won't. Jesus, he, he doesn't need a pedicure. His feet are like burnished bronze, man. When he comes back with fire in his eyes, there'll be no doubt who's in charge. It's like, like Joshua chapter 5. Joshua's about to go in to the battle of Jericho, and he meets this angel. Sword, sword's drawn, and jo Joshua says, are you on our side, or whose side are you on? He says, neither. I'm here with the armies of the Lord. And that's who Jesus is. He, he, he doesn't care what political party you're in. He, he's not about one or the other. He's about, he's taking over. He's taking control. He's bringing judgment. And when he comes, he makes things right. That's what he's doing here. And it's in this church that we see some things that they were doing right. And there's six things that they were doing right. It says here, that he said, I know your deeds. Their actual work. They're doing good stuff. If it was us, maybe they'd be feeding the homeless. Maybe they would be doing work in the inner city, rebuilding the houses. Maybe, I don't know what, they, what their deeds would be doing. Maybe they'd be working just helping people out that couldn't pay, pay their bills. I don't know what their deeds are. He says, your love. Jesus talked about love. He said, 
The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second, like it, love your neighbor as yourself. So I don't know how they were loving God and loving people. They were doing it, though. Their love was an example. He goes on in number three thing. He says, he said, your faith. No. He, he says, your faith. Faith is a demonstration of what, what you believe. And so they were doing things that showed they believed God was a powerful God. So some, something about their actions they were demonstrating their faith. Now, I, I worked for a company uh, called Newport for 21 years. And I told you before that, I had some, some uh, experience in ministry. <clears throat> and for 21 years working at Newport, some nights I'd wake up in a cold sweat. They're like a nightmare. Is this life? Because I, I know what it was like to live by faith and to see God move. And I'd wake up and I'd think, man, am I living by faith? Hebrews 11 says it's impossible to please God without faith. I wasn't pleasing God. My faith had no action to it. And year after year, I would think, man, am I, am I going to leave Newport this year? Four years ago, in March, I left there. One night, I told the guys, guys, I got to go, man. I can't live like this. I got I to leave. And, 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 you know, working there was easy. I had, I had a 401k go. I thought I was going to hit Making money was easy, but it was not life. And, and, and the time before, I would say things like, I'm providing for my family, you know. And sometimes we get into whatever we do, and we think, well, I'm providing for my family. But a lot of times, we're not providing for their needs. We might be providing a lot for their wants. And we can get a good goal of taking care of your family, we can take it to an extreme and take us out of a life of faith. In America, it's easy to do. It's easy to do in America. But I, I had to do something else. And so that, that, that drove me. Well, how, how do I live by faith? And so what, what, I had a friend, Spencer, he knows uh, a guy named Josh Barker, and I was starting doing some things, taking some action. We went to the Cedar Heights area. And we started uh, doing some, some feeding. We started taking some clothes there. We started uh, helping out different things, turkeys. There's a family, their, their, their house burned, lost everything. We helped them get new housing and got them some money and helped them replenish their clothes and all that. They had seven kids. And they were believers. <clears throat> we didn't know it. Somebody just called, hey, man, there's a family down there. Y'all need to help. Y'all help people. And so people started asking us to help out. We just thought we needed to do something. A lot of times our faith would take us into action. Now, now in, in the CRI area, we prayed we needed an apartment, somewhere we could have a base in ministry. And a realtor uh, back, uh, back in the summer said, hey, man, why don't you, get, I, got, I got apartments over there, and we got some older, why don't you take one of them? Maybe we could use it in the things you're doing. So we did that. And we had some guys living there. There's a guy here today, Brian Osborne, he lives there right now. He just came out of John 3 last week. He'd been in John 3 for six months. We found him homeless on the street. And it's one of those things where you start living by faith, and God starts doing things and bringing you things. And it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exciting life, but it, it can be scary. Because there's a lot of uncertain things. The, the, they have, have, have been living by faith. They were living by service, it says there, number four. And that service mindset is serving others, laying your life down for other people. Jesus said the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom. So evidently, they were displaying some type of servanthood when they were laying their life down for people. The revival was perseverance. And during those days, there was a lot of persecution for believers. <clears throat> they would get persecuted for their faith. And we're not, we're not seeing it as, as like they were seeing it, but it's coming here in America. It's no longer popular to be a Christian. Christians are looked at as being intolerant, judgmental. Like, man, you're against things. You're holding people back. I think the times are coming where we will have to persevere through sufferings for our faith. And some of you may not see it in your lifetime, but I believe in America it's coming. I don't think it's going to change drastically. Maybe we have to go through further things. I don't know. Maybe this pandemic is something. I don't know. A lot of churches have been closed their doors. People losing their businesses. Is this Something that God has allowed to happen because of sin? I, I, I'm not sure. But I know it is a result of sin. 
perseverance. And the, and the sixth thing he says and that you're doing more than you did at first. So they had this ministry of whatever things this church was doing. They were doing more of them than they did at first. They started well, and they were, keep, they were keeping it up. Their ministry was multiplying. And so when you think about here at First Christian, and our ministry here is what, how would people describe it? Would they say the six things Jesus said about this church, would they say that about our church here? That's something we need to evaluate. And, and do we want Jesus to be pleased with us individually, not, and us as a body? we got to ask those questions. And so that's something we want to be thinking about because Jesus says, if you abide in me, if you remain in me, you'll bear much fruit. So a sign of being in Christ is much fruit. Also says in that John 15 chapter that the Father is the vine dresser, and he will prune you to bear much fruit. So it's like, you get this idea, you're bearing fruit, you're doing well, people see in your faith, and then the, then the divine dresser might cut you back a little bit more so you can bear more. A lot of times we don't like that. And I don't know how that looks, you know, it could be just going through a dry spell where you don't feel God's alive. Where is he? Well, I've had these things happen. It could be a job loss, it could be a loss of a family member. Something that's, that's happening to think, where are you, God? And you want to see, are you going to trust him? Are you going to hang in there? Are you going to persevere? Because he wants you to bear much fruit. And he can't just give that to you. It's like giving the keys of a car to a 10-year-old. They're not ready for it, man. They got to work. They got to be developed. And he wants to give you that. We got to be developed. And then he moves into the second, second point here. Is uh, he says, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who called herself a prophet. In the church, they had some bad teaching, bad leadership come in. And then the woman Jezebel, there's a reference to her in 1 Kings 16. Jezebel was not a nice woman. Now she might, she might uh, pretty up really nice. She might put on her makeup and look good. But Jezebel in the scripture is not, it's not a good woman. She was King Ahab's queen. Ahab married her from another uh, group of people, probably with some type of political power alliance. He could gain more power and more with her. She comes into the, 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 the northern kingdom, Israel. She comes in there and she brings in idolatry. She brings in Baal worship. She brings in temple prostitution. She brings in all this stuff. She starts killing prophets. She starts killing the prophets of Yahweh. There's no doubt who she's working for. She's definitely a tool of Satan. Ahab's not messed up about it. He's one of the worst kings in the northern kingdom ever. So they're, they're, they're a pretty tough duo. Until Elijah comes on the scene, and there's a big show down there. He kills 450 prophets of Baal. That's this big display, something you can read about there in 1 Kings. And, and later on, you know, Jezebel gets her, her due. She, she is killed. Jezebel is not a nice person. Was, she, after Elijah did this big miracle calling fire down, the next day he runs because he hears Jezebel's going to know about this. Jezebel will be after Elijah. But he's not scared of 450 prophets of Baal. He's scared of Jezebel, though. He flees and runs. And God has to call him out of that. And so Jezebel in the Bible is not the kind of person. But the church had let her in. That's, that's kind of a question. How does that happen, man? How does the church let her in? You know, I run an RV park. It's been our family since 1955. We, uh, we converted over to RVs from a, from a trailer park in the year 2000 or so. And, and uh, we got our own sewer system. And all we want, we got, you know, water and all that. But the thing about the, the RV park is not, there's, we got 11 acres and we got to take care of all that. The main thing is you want to make sure the water goes into the trailer and the sewer goes out. <laughs> if it comes backwards, if you got water running out of the trailer, you got a problem. Or if you got if the sewer's coming back in, that, you know, you, you got to get the right flow going. So I, I, I've had to work on sewer lines, and, and it's amazing that a little crack in, in a pipe, a sewer pipe, 
small enough for a piece of hair to get in could cause a problem. But once that tree root mixes into that little crack a little bit, it starts to grow. Over time, over months, maybe years, it'll shut everything down. And you got to go in there and cut it out. Major problem. I've had to do that a couple times. And it's made as just a little crack. Paul says in Ephesians 5, 3, he says there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality among you. Not even a hint. Not even a little bit. Not even enough. Not nothing. But in the church, we've allowed all, kind, all kinds of things to come in. One of the things, a friend of mine wrote this book, uh, The Freedom Fight, and uh, this guy, Ted Shimmer, he plays linebacker at the University of Arkansas, come to Christ up there, and then he went on staff for student mobilization. We were on staff at the same ministry. And over time, Ted stayed on staff for student mobilization, and I left staff later on. But he began to counsel more and more people that had addictions and problems with pornography. He developed this app, and he's just recently come out with this book. But it's pretty amazing because with the with the, uh, the the producer of the iPhone, pornography hit another deal. It became visually based, so much images could it just incredible. And the addiction has just skyrocketed. Twenty five hundred times what it was twenty years ago. That's amazing. And so some of the things he, he, he put in this book is, is, is incredible because, like, he says that uh, of all the Christian men, all Christian men, just 100% of Christian men, 64% of them view pornography monthly. That's, that, that, that's amazing. And of non-Christian men, you take 100% of the non-Christian men, I don't know how you measure all that, but, but 100% of non-Christian men, 65% of them view pornography monthly. Not, not much difference between the church. Christians. This Jezebel spirit, this immorality has seeped its way into the cracks. But, and that, that's a problem. But they say men and women of pornography is 34% now is women. So it's not just a man's problem. It's, it's not just one. It's a family problem. They said, like, of all, all the kids under 18 years of age, 22% of them using pornography or ages of 10 years old. That's all the kids of 18 years of age, 20% of the 22% are using their 10 year old. It's amazing. It's not just a man problem. It's not just a woman problem. Now it's kids. And here's where it's going. He says, he says the re the reason, there's reason to expect the number of children addicted to porn to explode in the coming years. During the, the coronavirus pandemic of 2020, the organization called Amaze, a well-funded organization with a team of staff and volunteers, they launched their online sex education program for all the children learning at home. They took advantage of this pandemic to pollute it more. It teaches children that porn is normal, even a few times a day. What's their goal? Their goal is to reach 5 million children by 2022. That's incredible, isn't it? They have an agenda. They're trying to convert kids in, into this deal. And once a child thinks porn is normal, they'll spread the message with their favorite videos and they'll send to their classmates. They're trying to normalize it. It's, it's kind of become normalized in the church. Just recently, a month ago or so, the, one of the pastor of the mega church, he got called in, 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 in an affair. He got fired. Big church, you've heard a lot of their music. <clears throat> and he was about walking his dog and he met this girl walking her dog and they connected. In Ephesians 5 3 says, not even a hint. He starts talking to this woman out and suddenly gets her phone number and starts, you know the deal. There's a toleration that we've allowed in the church. And it's going to impact, it impact us for generations. How do we stop it? How do we say no? We got to start inside our walls first. Leadership. And I, I, I like, I love Don, your pastor here, our pastor here. He's a great guy. And I appreciate Don. Don needs support. He needs us behind him. He needs a group of people who, who are saying, no, we're not, we're not going to follow this type of immorality. We're not going to follow this stuff. We're going to stand for Jesus. And in the community, we're going to stand for some good things. 
When people talk about First Christian Church, they're going to see things about us. They're going to hear stories of what we're doing. And I'm going to say, well, what is it? What are they going to hear? You know? And so that, that, that's, that's what I'm excited about is we don't have to stand by and let things happen. We can take action. And he says here in verse uh, 24, Excuse me, verse 22. It says, I will, I will cast her on a bed of suffering. I'll make those committed adultery with her suffer intensely. In verse 23, I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will pay according to your deeds. And he says, Now to the rest of you of our attire, to you who do not hold her teaching, have not learned Satan's so called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have, what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious in 26, he says, to the end, and does, does my will, I will give authority over the nations. And that Jesus is coming back. You know, the uh, second coming of Christ, return of Christ, was a major theme in the New Testament. It's mentioned in every book of the New Testament except for Philemon. It's not mentioned in Philemon or second or third John. All the other books it's mentioned. The second coming of Christ was a big part of the teaching. <laughs> and, and a lot of it was motivation. I pray, Paul says, you may, you may be found worthy of the calling you have received until the day of Jesus' return, until we see his glory. He wanted the people to stay firm, stay in the faith until Jesus returns. They thought he was coming back in their day. You know, that was 2,000 years ago, and he didn't come back yet. Is he getting closer? I don't know. But our, our, our motivation has got to be we want to be pleasing to him on his return. Because he's coming back. And it's going to be one day. We don't know when. In, in Matthew 24, <clears throat> he gives signs of the time, signs of the age. He talks about, in Matthew 24, 14, he says, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world, testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. And then he goes through these parables of what the kingdom of God is like. So we know that the gospel is going to be throughout the earth, all the nations. Some say there's 16,000 nations in the world. There are roughly about a little over 8,000 are reached with the gospel. Almost half of them are not reached. But when we say the word nation, we're talking about a cultural or language group of people, not a geographic boundary. India, there's thousands of different languages, cultures there. For the gospel to go into India and reach, it's got to reach those individual cultures so they can hear the gospel and understand it. That's, that's the kind of thing about a people group, a language group, the nations. And so, Every, and the Revelation says every tribe, nation, people, language, tongue will be as a throne. So that's coming. We know that's got to happen. But in, in, in those parables, he talks about one parable that's kind of interesting to me. He says uh, there, were, there he gave five talents to one who had five talents. And one he gave two talents, and then one he gave one. And he says, I want you to do something with those talents. Invest and do something with them. When I come back, I want to see more. When he comes back, the one who had five talents had gotten, had produced ten talents. The one who had two, had doubled theirs and got four. And then, but the one who had one talent, which is interesting, he buried it, hid it. He didn't do anything with it. And Jesus says, no. He said, you know I'm a hard master. And, 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 the, and the guy said, hey, I thought I'd just keep it so I can give it back to you when you come back. He said, why don't you just, you could just put it in the bank. You got some interest. And because you didn't, I'm going to take it from you. He gave it to the one who, 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 who had five, who had the most. He gave it to him. Jesus is going to have a day where he wants to see what we've done with our life, with our faith. And it's not that we're working for our salvation. We work out of our salvation. Jesus already worked on our salvation. He wants to see, well, he says, it says about the uh, Luke 6, 46, he says, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do these things? And they'll say, no. Depart from me, never do you. He, 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 he could say, Lord, Lord, and he says, I never knew you. Well, we, we healed, we did miracles, we cast demons, we did all these actions. But relationally, he said, no, I didn't know you. And there will be others who will say, Lord, Lord, in Matthew 7, he talks about those, and they didn't have any actions. 
He said, you didn't put my words into practice. Depart from me, I never knew you. Both groups get cast away. So the, the, the one with the actions, they get cast away because they didn't have a relationship. The one that says, when we're Lord, Lord, you, you know, like we, we prayed the prayer. We call you Lord. He said, well, you didn't do anything I said. That, they didn't have a place with him. It's got to be both. If we call Jesus Lord and we trust in him, then our life is going to produce something. He said to the one, just get some interest, man. You've got to show something in return. But he wants more. He always wants more. He wants, he wants us to produce. He wants us to multiply. And as we work through, through this passage here, he says, the one will rule with an iron scepter and will dash them like pieces of the pottery, just as I have received authority. I will give one the morning star, and whoever hears to hear, hear what the church says. And you know, I don't understand that, what's going to happen, how, how it's all going to work its way out, but he's got some way that he rewards people for their deeds. And that's what he's talking about here in this passage is, that's got to be a motivation for us to live for him, because one day he's going to give us an account, and we're going to give an account of what we did with his life. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we, we got a little uh, French bulldog we've uh, we kind of fall in love. He's about a year old now. His name's Clancy. And uh, Clancy's a lot of fun, man. He, he gets up, you know, he goes outside, and he's made ready to play. And uh, well, we had to train him. And, and we've had him since he's three months. It took a lot of training, you know, but he's not all the way there yet. We still got a lot of work to do with Clancy. But, you know, French Bulldogs, man, they got these big ears, and they stick up, man. And, they're, and he, he's got some big ears. And, uh, it's like, like when they pin his he can kind of adjust them and move them around and pick up sounds. <laughs> and uh, man, he loves to get outside. He loves to get out of our, our yard and go, go for excursions. And I've had to patch holes and, and, and get set his boundaries because when he, once he gets out, man, he's, he's gone. He wants to investigate. And, uh, and I've had to chase him several times. And, you know, anyway, it's, it's, it's a, I've got a shot collar, but I haven't put it on him yet. I had to use that. He just, I, don't really, I don't know if I really want to start shopping him yet. But he's working on obedience. And so Clancy, man, as long as you've got rewards, you've got these little rewards for him, he'll do whatever you say. Man, he'll sit, come, uh, everything. Lay down, shake his hands. He'll, he'll do whatever he has. <clears throat> you got a reward for him. It's a big motive there. And even if I don't have a reward, if it's just me and him, man, he, he's quick to obey. He obeys real quick. He listens to my voice. But during, during the holidays, man, he had a lot of people in the house. He, he, had, he, he messed up a few times in the house. He had all these people around him. He doesn't know his boundaries. He doesn't know his schedule. A lot of people were telling him stuff. He, 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 it's hard for him to listen. He, sometimes he couldn't hear my voice and he wasn't paying attention to what I was saying. And so I think, man, a lot of times we're like, we're like Clancy. We, we get in the Word, and God's speaking to us. We hear it. We hear his voice. We get out in the world, and everything's speaking to us. Everything's competing for our attention, pulling us, drawing us. You better believe it is. And can we listen to the voice of God amidst all the other voices? Jesus says, my sheep will hear my voice. My sheep know my voice. And being able to listen to his voice out in a world that's pulling us in every direction, man, that's a challenge. And then life comes. Life starts hitting us. Will we still listen to God if we lose our job, if we lose our health, if we, if we, whatever? Will we still listen and believe that he's a good God? He's got something for us. That's the challenge we have. Now, these people at Thyra Tire, they had some good things they were doing, but they had let this cesspool come into their church. Started out small, I guess. I don't know how it happens. Paul talked about it. 1 Corinthians 3, I think this church was a lot like 1 Corinthians, uh, the, the Corinthians church. They had a lot of gifts and done a lot of good things. But there was jealousy and quarreling. They were fighting. They said, one follow, I follow Paul. One says, I follow Paul. One says, I follow Jesus. They, 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 didn't, they didn't follow anyone. They were following everybody. And then they were following these super apostles that invaded the church. Paul always was in combat with these, uh, with these people coming in trying to gain the power. 
And this has happened here in this church. But, you know, when we think about it, Hebrews 10, 24, 25 says, let us not give up the habit of meeting together. The summary, summary of the habit of let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching, this day approaching, when Jesus comes back. The power of the fellowship. Let us consider how we may spur another on, one another on to love and good deeds. That's why we need each other. You think about Paul, I don't, I don't know what comes to your mind when you think about Paul. I mean, he was like one of the greatest Christians and did a lot of things. But in his last book, he wrote 2 Timothy. In chapter 4, verse 9, I'm going to read this a little bit. But he mentioned 17 people's names. It's the last book. Two of them are negative, 15 are positive. Then he mentions like a household. I don't know how many people are in a household. Maybe 10, I don't know. They had big households here. And he mentioned brothers, plural. So we're looking at 15, anywhere from 10 to 15 more, maybe 30 or so people he mentions. Did Paul need people around him? Did he want others helping him? He empowered others to lead churches. That was what he was doing, was developing, discipling these men to become leaders. That's what, that's what he was known for. He says, do your best to come quickly to me. Demas is gone. They love the world. Christians had gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. These other guys were going out, helping establish churches. Luke is with him. Get Mark. Bring him with me. He's helpful. He and Mark had had a disagreement earlier. And I said, bring Mark to me. He's helpful. Paul was able to restore a conflict. Man, that'd be great if you do that a lot. He, he restored conflict with the brother. And he says, I sent uh, Tychicus to Ephesus. I left uh, with Carpus at Troas. Alexander had done me the metal work, didn't me much harm. And he says, uh, may the Lord uh, not hold against the ones who deserted me. And he goes on to say, Greek Priscilla and Aquila, the household of Lamessi Forest, Erastus, stayed in Corinth. I left Trophimenes and Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. And you got somebody with him. He says, Eubulus greets you. As so does these other guys, Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. Greet you. All these people, man. Paul was not a loner. Paul did ministry with the king of people. Paul did ministry with others. He empowered others. He gave away authority. He gave away power. He was a servant. He says, I come to serve. And so that's what we need to be known for, man. How are we empowering others? How are we serving others? That should be one of our hallmarks. And, and, th and this chapter he closes with, let he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And today, as we close, do we have the ears to hear what the Spirit's telling us? That's what we want to ask this year. What is the Spirit telling us? And lead us somewhere if we're open. Let me close in prayer. <clears throat> Father, we come to you, thank you for today, thank you for your word and, and all the truth that you, you're, you give us in that, and that uh, you, you don't leave us here alone, you've you got a fellowship for us, there's others around us, you want us to team up, we're not to be isolated, we don't live this Christian life by ourselves, you've got leaders, you've got people to equip us, you've got people that love us, and we want to display those things, and we thank you for your truth this morning. Thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen.
a wonderful, wonderful message. We are so blessed to have you here. If Paul House will lead us in closing prayer. Yes, if you'll stand with us. And Trey, I really like your hairstyle. <laughs> I believe uh, do I? <laughs> Joe, don't we have a meeting of the elders after this yes. today to elect a chairman and a representative of the elders? We also forgot to get it in the bulletin this week. We have a board meeting on the 24th at 2 o'clock. On the 24th at 2 o'clock, so the deacons need to get together and elect their chairman of the deacons and their representative also. Uh, again, Wednesday night, please, uh, especially those that signed up and got your packets, let's be here and let's discuss that and talk about uh, which way we're going with that. Now, let's pray, <coughs> let's, let's close with a prayer. Most Heavenly Father, we thank you for this service we've had today and all the, the message we've received through many different facets. Help us, Lord, to take it in, to make us better Christians uh, in this world because this world has so much that's going on that we can't let it take us down. We need to be strong. We need to show the light of Jesus Christ throughout this world. Help us to do that and help us to bring others in. We pray this through Jesus and say, Amen. Amen.